everyone. My name is Tanaya Bethke. I'm the Director of Operations with the Council to Advance Hunting and the Shooting Sports. And we are here today to record the very first webinar in a long series talking about ways to build out your R3 team and collaborate across silos in within and externally uh, for your organization. So we're so excited to welcome guests today to talk through this content together. And I'd like to kick it out to the crowd and ask each of you to introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Tana Fancher. I'm the R3 coordinator with the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks. Hi there, Jessica Mounts, the Director of Licensing and Education for Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks. I'm Lacey Elrod. I am the Director of the Outdoor Campus with South Dakota Game Fish and Parks. And I'm Kelsey Harris, Director of Marketing at Bryant Information Services. Hello, everyone. I'm Lance Cherry. I'm the Communication and Marketing Manager for the Council to Advance Hunting and the Shooting Sports. Awesome. We have an incredible team with us today. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, to kick off our conversation, Jessica, I'm going to hand it over to you and would love to hear some of your thoughts about the shift and internal shift in creating some of those partnerships across silos and what that was like for you in Kansas. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so to kind of start off with, I just want to um, give a little bit about my background. So working for a state agency, and I think, um, you know, a lot of the folks who may be listening to this conversation um, work for state agencies and the very nature of government is very structural, right? It's very authority. There are chains of command. You know, the way our agency set up is we literally use the word divisions to stay working in our silos, right? And so we had a lot of like inter internal, and we still have a lot of internal culture going on um, that creates these kinds of challenges. And so when I, um, when I started um, working in this position and started working to combine, um, to actually physically combine the two um, sections of education and licensing into one big division, um, about 15 months ago, I was hired to do that. And so many people looked at that and said, why? That doesn't make any sense. And to me, I was like, it makes perfect sense. We're taking all of the super technical stuff that we have all this technology, all these ways that we interact with our customers. And then we're looking at it through the lens of an adaptive challenge of there's so much to learn from this that can guide our way forward. And so really the two teams, what we have spent, um, the shift that, that as you called it, um, really has been um, creating the space for adaptive work allowing allowing the technical stuff to continue, but then continually asking the question of what are we learning? What are we learning? What are we learning if we experiment in this way? That didn't work. How can we do it better next time? And um, and so that's really the role, I guess, of of authority of if you if you do have some authority um, in your agency um, and create and can use it to create these spaces for your teams to do this work and have this conversation. Um, and, the, and the stuff that Tana is going to walk us through here in a little bit too um, is a really important part of that. Does that does that help you guys understand kind of kind of the is that does that answer your question? A million times, yes. And okay. you said it brilliantly. I think what's really amazing that you pointed out is these are oftentimes um, adaptive challenges that people are approaching with technical solutions. And that doesn't work when you're talking about institutional and organizational change. 
And, you know, when you're talking about bringing together groups of people that have been working separately for long periods of time or, you know, have a long tradition of, of processes that are in place and building momentum in that way, it can be really hard to overcome those adaptive challenges. So I love that you came at that from um, a collaborative and adaptive approach. I think that is really cool. And um, Tana, I know you're going to cue us up next to talk about ways that we can be very intentional about those adaptive challenges and ways that we can help leverage people's values to help overcome some of those challenges together as a team. Absolutely. Thanks, Tanaya, and thanks to Jessica for kicking us off. We, uh, through Jessica's leadership, we've had a great opportunity to utilize some of the tools that I'll be talking about today and uh, just experiment with those even outside of our agency through expanded relationships with Hunter Education volunteers and much, much more. So it'll be really exciting to apply these to the challenge that is the exploring the relationship between R3 and licensing. All right, so when we're exploring this relationship between R3 and licensing, we recognize that this has been an ongoing conversation for numerous years, but why is that? And if we understand that um, a culture of collaboration needs to be built between the two divisions, why haven't we just flipped a switch and built it? So one possible answer lies in our approach. When we think about the challenge of breaking down silos and building a more collaborative relationship between licensing and R3 staff, what type of challenge are we facing? And that's exactly what Jessica and Tanaya both alluded to in the beginning. What type of solutions have we tried? It may be that progress has been hindered because we're a community of problem solvers and our automatic response is to apply a technical solution to a challenge that is perhaps much more adaptive. So to better understand who has a stake and who might need to be involved when making progress on an adaptive challenge, we can categorize using factions. Factions are a group of people who share values. They're often loyal to the same things and share a common orientation to the work before them. Making progress on an adaptive challenge often requires working across these factions and groups. And when I reference factions today and uh, many of the tools that we're going to be utilizing. A lot of that information was gathered through the Kansas Leadership Center, so I do want to recognize them. So to better understand how to best work across factions, we can utilize an exercise called faction mapping. So within faction mapping, looking at that group of people with similar values within an adaptive challenge, we can identify their values, loyalties, and losses associated with making progress on that challenge. Values might be deeply held beliefs, often based on lived experiences. Loyalties represent a connection to a group, place, people, or way of doing things. And losses represent what we give up to make progress. So as Tanaya mentioned, that could be influence, control, power, or even familiarity with a system. We can use a faction map to better consider these values, loyalties, and real or perceived losses that licensing might face or our three staff might face when making progress on our adaptive challenge, which is breaking down silos and building a more collaborative relationship between licensing and our three staff. So based on these considerations, we can also estimate how much we might need the buy-in and support of licensing and our three staff to make progress on this challenge and how much they care about the issue at hand. So with the example of licensing and permitting staff, if we were to utilize this faction mapping process to better understand what might be going on in this system, we can map their values, loyalties, and losses as you see on the screen here. When doing this faction mapping exercise, we always wanna keep in mind that our interpretations of our faction should be noble. We want to assume the absolute best intentions and that everyone wants to move in a direction that will make progress toward this issue. So as you can see, some guesses as to what licensing and permitting staff might value, perhaps they value efficiency, customer service, and independent work. They really like to find the issue, solve the issue, and get the job done. Perhaps they're loyal to the customer, to their current licensing system, or the system they're most used to working within, and their own process. They've had a system, they've had that figured out for a while. Perhaps that's something that licensing staff are loyal to. It's possible that when R3 staff comes in and tries to build this relationship or the two start working together, on either end, there could be a sense of a loss of control or decision-making power. There could be a loss of personal sense of purpose or job duties. If in any of these efficiencies being uh, had progress being made on them, perhaps a title that someone once held or a duty that they once had 
has now become obsolete or has looked and completely shifted in a different way. We could also lose, in that sense, knowledge and comfort with the system and knowing what's going on and what could happen next. So understanding all this can help us better understand how we can work across these factions and just be a little bit more aware as we're building this relationship. We can also identify approximately how much we need each faction involved and how much they care about the issue. Keep in mind too that when building this relationship between R3 staff and internal licensing staff, there are many other factions at play and Kelsey's gonna talk a little bit more about that because our external license vendors could also be a representative faction within this system as well. So with this activity, you can take it and try it yourself. You can map the factions in your system with your team and ask yourselves, what do we notice? What patterns do we see? How are these values, loyalties, and losses showing up and affecting our daily work? How will these considerations help us make progress on our adaptive challenge? Failing to make progress on this adaptive challenge to break down silos and build a more collaborative relationship between licensing and R3 staff could negatively impact the work we do internally, but the ripple effects could also be felt by our customers and constituencies. So to demonstrate, let's see how these values, loyalties, and losses show up in a simulated customer journey. So we're gonna start with the Matt Dunphy customer journey and a huge shout out to Matt Dunphy for uh, demonstrating or uh, donating his likeness, whether he knew it or not for this activity. It's so, eerily, eerily accurate. <laughs> it is. And thank you to Brant for that uh, likeness for creating that avatar. Okay, so in this simulated experience, we're gonna say that Matt moved to Kansas three years ago and is interested in exploring the deer hunting opportunities near his new home in the Sunflower State. So as Matt navigates this journey, help us celebrate the little wins where his experience has been made easier due to the hard work and collaboration of R3 and licensing staff and where lack of collaboration has led to barriers in his customer journey. Like many new hunters trying to learn more, the first thing Matt does is Google hunting in Kansas. So Matt doesn't know it, but the licensing team has worked with R3 and marketing staff to implement search engine optimization and digital ads. So because of this, Matt is able to click the first link that appears and go right to the KDWP website to learn more. <laughs> All right, Matt then realizes he took hunter education in Colorado back when he was 14. So he has no idea where his card is. Does Kansas reciprocate? Will he need to call Colorado to request a copy of his certification card and to buy his permit? He checks the Kansas website, but can't find any information. Guess he'll have to call Colorado. Matt's able to get a duplicate hunter education card from Colorado and feels he's ready to purchase his Kansas hunting license and deer permits. Back on the website, Matt's overwhelmed with all the different types of permits he could potentially buy. He looks for a buying guide walking him through the different permit types and qualifications, but he doesn't find one. He wonders if he needs anything other than his license and deer tag, like a habitat stamp, for example. He decides to look for packages that include everything he needs to hunt deer in Kansas, but unfortunately, he doesn't find any. Deterred, Matt decides to go to an in-person license vendor so he can get help picking the right permit for him. It was a little inconvenient, but he comes to a KDWP office, gets great customer service, and leaves with an electronic license and deer permit, which he was able to store and access on his mobile wallet or in the KDWP mobile app. Matt's so excited for his hunt, but when he gets home that evening, he pulls out his phone to review his mobile permit. Upon seeing all the abbreviations and unfamiliar permit language, he begins to sweat. DMU, RES, WAO. Oh no, how many deer is this permit even valid for? Is it valid throughout the state? What the heck is a DMU? It's like a foreign language. Matt sleeps poorly that night. He's anxious about his hunt and wants to be sure he's hunting legally and ethically. When he wakes up in the morning, he goes straight to the KDWP licensing website to try to learn more. While he's there, he finds a tab of definitions and FAQs. Matt learns about what each abbreviation on his permit means and is able to get most of his questions answered. He feels relieved and his excitement about the hunt returns. Matt goes out on his hunt and is excited to see lots of deer, including a big buck. Is his permit good for an antler deer though? He goes to check his permit, but can't seem to find it in his mobile wallet. Luckily, Matt remembers that he can look up his account and access his privileges on the mobile app. Thank goodness. 
Matt returns to the same hunting spot on Sunday and is able to harvest a deer. He is ecstatic. As he goes to tag the carcass, he remembers that he has a mobile deer permit. How does that work? Does he need to report his harvest? How does he tag out with no actual tag? He isn't sure if he should call a game warden or a KDWP license agent for help. He calls the KDWP office and gets an answering machine. Oh, yeah, it's Sunday. He pulls up his permit on his phone and sees a tab for how to tag and report your deer on the KDWP mobile app. Matt clicks the tab and is able to read through the process. He feels certain he's tagged his harvest legally. Matt field dresses his deer and heads home. When he gets there, he pulls out his phone and is surprised to find a push notification on his phone, directing him to a KDWP YouTube video, walking him through the process of breaking down a deer for the freezer. He watches the video in amazement. He honestly never thought he'd even get that far. He's thankful for the guidance and excited to show the video to his wife and kids. Later that night with his venison in the freezer, he receives an email from KDWP licensing department congratulating him on his harvest and thanking him for reporting. The email includes a brief statement about how his harvest data and license dollars will be used and why it's so important. Matt goes to bed exhausted, but feeling good about his contributions to wildlife conservation and management. A few weeks later, Matt gets another email from the KDWP licensing section about turkey season in Kansas. He sees the unit he wants to hunt requires a lottery draw permit. He marks the date to apply on his calendar and begins researching regulations. They seem complex, but he knows there are resources there to help him. He feels like a valuable customer of KDWP and steward of the outdoors. Now, let's go hunt some thunder chickens. Hooray, victory for everyone. <laughs> awesome. So that's a really fun and oversimplified customer journey, of course, and I do uh, want to reiterate that that is a, fun, a fictional customer journey, so I'm not necessarily saying that uh, Kansas can claim all of those good things and certainly not claiming all the bad ones, but um, by understanding our factions and how they show up in an adaptive challenge, this can help us design strategic interventions to engage, learn, and ultimately get buy-in from these diverse factions. So I ask you to consider how did our factions show up in this exercise? What values, loyalties, and losses may have come into play? What do you think occurred to make Matt's customer journey run smoothly? And what's an example of an intervention we could experiment with that might allow R3 and licensing staff to make progress on their collaboration-based adaptive challenge, resulting in an even smoother customer journey? So let's consider how these challenges are showing up in our daily work and the role that some of our factions may play in addressing those. As always, it can be tempting to jump to technical solutions, and it's good to identify those, but we may be avoiding some important work by focusing only on the technical side. So let's keep things broad and adaptive. That is awesome. You know, Tana, that was an incredible representation of the things that Jessica was talking about, ways that you can adapt over time. And I just thank you so much for being so articulate with the way that you described that. Um, you know, I, I come from an R3 practitioner background, right? And it's really easy when you come into a position to think that these are the only resources that you have access to in a position. But what you just outlined was how important it is to enhance the toolkits that not only you have access to, but other members within and outside of your organization also have access to. But you can't do things like what you just talked about as a customer journey by yourself, right? All of the little pieces that you stitched together for the customer, whether it was email notifications, programs, licensing, seasons that were, you know, notifications, emails, all of that had to be tied together using the expertise of a collective group of people. Like licensing can't do that by themselves. R3 can't do that by themselves. The vendor can't do it by themselves. It takes the collaboration that you're talking about. And I just really love how you and Jessica both spoke to faction mapping, like the ways that if you are going to be engaging with these broader teams, we can navigate that smoothly by first helping to understand their values and their loyalties and their losses um, before jumping into shaking everything up and, and transforming the way that you do business. So thank you both for that. Um, I think that really did an amazing job of outlining, like not only how you can use faction mapping, um, but also how you can inform your customer journey. Um, does anybody else have any thoughts about that exercise or maybe you've, you've used something similar to engage in your work in that way? 
yeah, I just kind of want to reiterate what you said, Tanaya. Um, in any system, but especially in our system, change can feel scary. And we've also um, observed that coming in and asking questions and shaking it up, like you mentioned, can feel really threatening. And so applying these tools within our systems, whether it be with Hunter Education, with R3 and licensing, or any of the various other relationships that we've built internally or externally can help us take a much, much more informed and empathetic approach to the issue and really get at the core of what lies underneath. And uh, we've definitely seen the ripple effects, I think throughout our agency and definitely within the challenges at hand. I think that's a really good thought. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a setup and just been like, what? this makes sense. Let's just do it. Cause it makes sense. Right. Why, why are you resistant to the thing that makes sense? But from your perspective, being able to understand those values and loyalties and losses, like helps you step into someone else's shoes and like see the change through their eyes and help them help not only yourself, but help them understand positive things that the change could result in. So I think that was a great part of your exercise. Thank you. Um, Kelsey, I saw you took yourself off mute. Um, when Tana said the word empathy, it totally resonated with me thinking about I think the intention of the faction mapping, which is a tool that I hadn't heard before uh, speaking with Tana before on it, which I, I'm using and now processing and gives me some tools and things to think about. It's really, how can you be more empathetic? How can you walk in their shoes? How can you see it from their perspective? And it gives you different tools and things to help you if you don't, don't know where to start to understand where someone else could be coming from. Um, and uh, Brant being the licensed vendor, right? We're the third party coming in to these different divisions and groups and trying to figure out who works with who and whose job is what and wanting to help everybody. It sort of is being that mediator in that middle of like, okay, but, but we need this group and that group and this group to somehow all work together. Um, and that's what everyone's goal and intention is, right? We all have similar at the super high level broad goals of serving the public and outdoor conservation um, but we just come at it from totally different perspectives and being able to empathize with the different parties really um, puts us in the right direction thank you for those thoughts and you're absolutely spot on that empathy piece is huge um lacy what, what thoughts do you have about that um i agree with the the empathy because i think when you implement a big change if you go into a group of people and they know that your thought process is to make sure that they're being taken care of and their needs and values are being addressed and taken into, con into consideration that that's just the first step in making something successful. So I think again, that empathy is, is most important in showing that you have, are going to take the time to listen to everybody. Yeah. And having, I think that exactly Lacey and having a, a set process to guide you through that or make it an internalized part of, of the way that you implement change through faction mapping, I think is a really cool way to do that. Cause I think a lot of folks blow straight past that part. Right. But if it's like, Hey, this is a formalized part of our process. We're going to faction map together. That helps make it be like a firm intentional piece. And you can do this with anybody. I was just thinking, man, I wish I would have done this with our law enforcement staff when we were partnering on different projects. I wish I would have done this with external stakeholder groups when we were doing stakeholder meetings. You know, any new vendors, man, this would have been a really useful tool when I was a practitioner at that time. So thank you again for that resource. Any additional thoughts from the group before we move on to a couple of questions? Well, I, I just kind of wanted to share like a really, um, I don't know, specific kind of case in point about, um, about what we're going through right now, because, um, you know, and I'll, I'll just be transparent. Kansas is currently rebuilding our licensing system and we're, and we're um, doing it alongside Brandt. And so um, we're, we're working very closely with them in this last 38 days before we go live. I'm not counting. Um, but one thing that's come up um, in building this system is that we are, we're working on building a location check-in and check-out. And it's something that we've been using previously. We had a previous solution for it, but we're rebuilding it. And as this sort of came up alongside it, another project's been developing about the way that we, um, about, about the way that we support paddling recreation in Kansas. And so what we realized in working with um, these two different groups is that we had an opportunity to start um, asking for location check-in and check-out at these public paddling access sites that we don't have any idea because we don't sell permits or, or collect customer data from, from people who are paddling. And this is a growing, growing population. However, when I asked um, 
our public lands division about adding these public access sites in, there was an extreme resistance. And I literally sat down one evening and mapped this division as a faction. And I was like, who are they loyal to? Oh, they're loyal to traditional users who are already purchasing hunting and fishing licenses, right? Um, what are they going to lose? They might lose some major control of public lands if we start listening to a wider audience. And so that really helped me um, make progress in that conversation, just thinking about it very specifically through this faction mapping. Thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, I certainly come from a wildlife biology background. And so having emotional intelligence like that takes practice and, and having tools to guide this process, I think is a really valuable piece for, especially for folks where this may not be a natural part of your process when you're engaging in change. Uh, maybe you are more used to implementing technical adaptations or creating technical solutions. And so um, I, I love what you just spoke to of just taking the time to slow down and really think about things from multiple perspectives before creating change and how that helped. Um, I think that's awesome. Cool. Well, if you guys are ready, I've got just a handful of questions for you to consider and for us to just kind of discuss openly if that works for you all. Cool. Um, so the first question I have for the group is, if you don't already have a high quality relationship internally between your licensing team and maybe your education or R3 team, um, what are some ways, maybe some creative approaches that might help you build bridges between those teams? I hear everybody likes cookies and muffins. Like I'm a big fan of carbs. I don't know about you all, but <laughs> you feed me and I'll be your friend forever. That'll definitely get me in the room, Tanaya. <laughs> I mean, using, um, using our agency as an example, I mean, the technical solution was to create a new division that included this really adaptive part of the agency and the really technical work of the agency. That was the technical solution, but that was not easy. Um, um, and so what I, I mean, so that's one thing you could do, <laughs> but, but it's, but it isn't that easy, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And that it's really about relationship building and just looking for opportunities to collaborate, even if it's just like the smallest and it may be, it, it is, trust me, it is as simple as asking a question. Um, what do you think about this? What would you do differently? Who might else, who else might this affect? Um, very simple questions like that are a really great place to get started. Yeah, man, I know how valued I feel when people ask me questions like that and just want my genuine input and perspective. I think that's a great point, Jessica. Lacey, what do you think? I um, have only been with Game Fish and Parks for a, a couple of years, so I'm still building those relationships with everyone. But I think that licensing, I feel really disconnected from them. And do they know what we do? So, and do we know what they do? Is it just as, you know, are they just setting up a program so that somebody can get a deer license? I mean, what else is it part of their job? So I think just the basic bare bones, like what do we do and what are our goals for each of our departments? And then just, you know, having those conversations and informing each other of what's happening in our worlds. I think you bring up a really good point that we, we tend to work very isolated from one another. You know, I, Lacey, I know you're very much within the campus world, you know, the outdoor campus world and, and the relationships that you have in your community and, and, you know, licensing isn't, is also housed in a different community. There's not a lot of face time between each of you. And so just even understanding the work responsibilities of each team is different. I like how you talked about coming at this from a place of curiosity, you know, like, what does your world look like? Let's, let's talk. I think that's awesome. I think something that's helped me visualize too is understanding how um, both licensing and R3 interact on the outdoor recreation adoption model and like what stages of the customer journey they're coming in and working together on. And um, typically it's not one or another, it's more like, okay, if licensing is the boat, R3 is the paddle, helping people get there. And just how deeply intertwined those two are. So coming into a system as an R3 coordinator, I'm not coming to licensing and saying, hey, I'm gonna do this, this, and this and take all this away from you. I'm saying, hey, recognizing what you do, how can we build this system together and recognize these areas where we are so intertwined and highlight that? 
Yeah, I think that's excellent. And I think you're right. You know, when you come in and you're like, hey, I'm going to change your world. <laughs> you're going to have no say in it. <laughs> that's not an easy sell. Um, but really talking about how you can contribute to the process together or you just showing genuine care and consideration for the work product that'll come out of it is a really cool perspective and approach. It's a unique relationship too, because both um, education and licensing are so customer facing, but it's in very different forms. You know, you've got your education events, your NASP tournaments, et cetera, versus staff that are helping with customer service related issues or that sales um, opportunity. So it's, it's interesting, the similarities and differences that are there. And, and the, I think the Tana, the um, example that you used of, of Mr. Dunphy um, really even opened my eyes at how much we could both be um, better partners. Like I, wow, uh, a notification on how to, you know, process your deer when you get home. I was writing that down. I'm stealing that idea. So I think it's, I mean, just seeing those examples of ways that we can work together that we didn't even think of before. Yeah. And Lacey, to your point, making it be like a, a mutually beneficial relationship or helping, you know, licensing to understand, hey, we can get more people drive into your system through our programs or through our initiatives and vice versa, you know, licensing, you can help us identify who potential candidates could be for additional programs and notifications. You know, it's a two way street. I, I think you pointed that out in a, a really good way, Lacey. Um, Kelsey, what were your thoughts? I think part of it has to do with going back to the relationship building part of it. And I, I can't say from me being a licensing person, going to an R3 person or the other way around I'm on the outside part of it. If you can't walk down the hall and give them cookies and cake, because I would totally become your best friend as well tonight, send it my way. We'll be buddies. Um, but like Lacey, you're in a different building in a different community than, you know, GFP licensing staff or in the past few years, everyone went remote. How do you maintain those relationships when you don't see anyone face to face when you can't walk down the hall anymore? Um, so finding ways digitally to build that relationship is also really valuable. Um, and so, some things that have worked for me and, and that factor is the um, just sending a quick note a meme, a hi, and making your ask super tiny. So when they're like, oh, when I hear from Kelsey, it's something I can actually do. It's not like, oh man, what is she asking for again? This is gonna take my entire day. I'm gonna have to do something totally different. Just start small, say hi, ask for a little thing. When you call someone, keep it short. Their time is valuable. You wanna show that you value them by you valuing their time and not just taking it up because you don't get to see them very often but being like, I promise you this is gonna be a two minute call. I'm going to make it a two minute call. So then that way, when you call the next time, they go, I can, I do have time for this instead of it being a big ask because then it'll be even more daunting the next time. So just those like little baby steps and crumbs uh, can help you build that base relationship that you need to then feel comfortable uh, collaborating with the different groups. And the rock star advice coming out of this group today is excellent. And I appreciate those nuggets, Kelsey. That's absolutely spot on. Uh, the next question that I have for the group is um, what aspirations do you have for using um, licensing data, for example? You know, if, if, if you could more fully engage in this, like what could the world look like? You know, what kinds of things would you like to use this for? Something that I've been thinking about lately is kind of bookending our data collection and going back to the faction mapping exercise. So if I've faction mapped our licensing um, section, for example, and I've determined that they really value customer service, when it comes to the data gathering, what can I share back with the licensing team that demonstrates an increase in customer satisfaction? So I'm in there tracking all the licenses sold and um, where people are at in the ORAM. Maybe there's data there that they could benefit from and we could both share in that success from a place that's rooted in our deeply held values and beliefs as well. Mm, I love it. Absolutely. I think that is awesome. I'm a data nerd and everything that is done is because there is data proving, or I think that this could end in data proving the success in whatever we're tracking. Even to go off of that, Tana, like the if we were to have sent out these emails, then it decreased customer call center calls and which decreased wait time, which got more people out in the field and, and all those things add up. Um, so being able to speak that language of what your goal is and how I can prove to you that this helped with that. 
Um, I think a lot of it also comes around to like marketing automation related initiatives and things that we can set in place to automatically occur throughout that customer journey that it is no longer a manual effort by a team member in order to execute. So there's a lot of things that teams are currently doing every year, sending out or calling or doing every year, the things that could be automated. So then that way you can move on to focus on the bigger challenges, the bigger opportunities and what's next rather than just keeping up with everything that's going on. Um, so it's, it's a lot of initial work to get there, but the intention is to help everyone in the end. Uh, noticing with that faction, it also has to do with if it takes away from someone else's role, what would that role be? And so visioning with them, this is not in place of that role. This is to allow that role to, didn't you always want to think about that? Didn't you always want to move on to the next thing? Like you can forward momentum progress throughout all of this. You just hit on something really huge, Kelsey. And one thing that I've been challenged with is a lot of folks view change as a threat or a loss, right? As opposed to an opportunity to excel in an area you've always wanted to, right? And I think, you know, as leaders in conservation and as leaders in our organizations, we have an opportunity to frame up change in that way, as long as we understand what people do view as a potential loss, right? As long as we can speak to those losses and help people feel heard, I do think we have an opportunity to shift perception towards um, towards how exciting some of these can things can be, because you're absolutely right. Haven't you always wanted to have time to do these things? You know, now with with these efficiencies that are built in through collaboration, you might actually have a chance to, to you know, succeed in that way. And um, that's definitely the way that I view the world and get excited about. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, Lacey, from your perspective at the campus, I know you lead a lot of different programs there and you see a lot of folks coming through, at, um, like learn to hunt, learn to fish programs, you know, what's some aspirations that you might have with, um, additional access to hunting information or licensing information? My team and I have, have thought long and hard about how we can really utilize some of the data that we could get from licensing and, you know, working through our pathway program. So after we provide these programs for people, what next? So being able to track them through the process of, you know, coming to our educational programs and then going and ending up harvesting a deer, does it then, or, or a bird or whatever that animal is, does it then end there? How can we continue to push them forward or provide more opportunities for them? Um, and, and so we're really looking at where they are in that ORAM model, how we can keep them moving forward and not just ending our programs at um, what we think the end is. That might not be the end for those people. They might, you know, this year alone, we've, um, we've realized after we've done Hunting 101, focusing on deer, that it really opened the the door up for those people to then um, take up on game birds. And, and so we, we just need to keep fostering that uh, passion that those people have um, come to realize through our programming and being able to tap into some of that licensing information will be extremely beneficial. Um, and I'm excited to, to see some of that once we kind of get up and running a little bit more. Um, and also something I think Kelsey mentioned, hit on a little bit was, um, those automated things that we could help them with. But we talk a lot about breaking down barriers. We might not as educators realize some of the barriers that we could do that are, are, are super simple in the terms of it might just be an easy fix. We have customers coming in here that I overhear their barriers on not being able to um, utilize our public access maps. They don't know what they mean. So what can we do to help break down those barriers that may then end up reducing calls that the help center has to field. So I think real being able to know what some of those barriers are from the licensing side of things and the licensing agent people, um, that might help. We can add that to our classes. We can change those barriers and put those in our programs and, and be able to you know, help multiple people out. I love how you just framed that up, Lacey. I think the idea that a customer journey uh, engages them with not only a singular team, but all of the teams within an organization and all of the partners that an organization has externally, right? And that unless we are all coming at 
one customer journey with a multi-pronged approach, we're not really being as efficient and effective as we could be, right? So I like how you were saying, you know, we can enhance the rest of that customer's journey by collaborating across the department is, is that's just a great way to frame that up. Thank you. Um, I have one, sorry, go ahead, Jessica. No, I, I was just going to say, you know, something else is just kind of coming up and that's um, transparency, um, like being really open about what you're up to. You know, um, sometimes, I mean, well, I know that can create a ton of, of trust. Like if, if people are always going, what, what's licensing doing over there? What's, what's R3 doing over there? And, and that's the question. You're getting more questions than, than support. It might be because you haven't communicated like the purpose to what you're doing, or you haven't been as transparent, um, about like why you're asking all these questions as you need to be. Um, and so that just, I guess, being really clear to the people that you're trying to engage about what you're actually up to, and then being willing, like Tana said, to, to make it relevant back to them. Like, what do you really care about? Okay, well, if we work together, here's how I can help you work smarter, not harder. Mm, absolutely. Gosh, there's so many good nuggets in this conversation. I wish we were recording it. Oh, wait, we are. <laughs> awesome. Um, Jessica, thank you for those thoughts. So we've got one final question to wrap up with here today, and then we'll be right at about that hour mark. Um, so within your system, I, I don't want to end on a negative note, but I do want to address within your system or within your relationships, um, what losses or perceived losses might you experience and how might you address them? And this does relate back to our earlier conversation about relationship building. Um, but, you know, what have you all experienced and, and what are some ways that you might help address some of those perceived losses? I think one perceived loss that I've seen come up is a perceived loss of trust. So if you come into a system and you're asking, well, what are you doing? What are you up to? What's your purpose? Why that? That can come across as I don't trust you to do your job. I don't trust what you're working towards. And so that perceived loss of trust can be mitigated. Um, if we always say that R3 is everyone's job and we're working across this system, why are we keeping licensing data hidden behind the curtain? Why are we keeping some of these R3 programs hidden behind a curtain? And so to help mitigate that real or perceived loss of trust, like Jessica said, we can speak to them the transparency and say, if R3 is everyone's job, um, these are the ways that we can all work together in a way that is completely open and collaborative. I love that. Over-communication really can lead to enhanced transparency and trust. Absolutely. And can speak to loss as well. What other perceived losses might you have experienced? You know, as we've made, as we've worked towards making um, a very real transition to a different vendor um, over the past few months, I, we've taken things that have been, it's 2022 folks, but we're still accepting applications on paper, um, but we won't be coming May 1st. And there was a very real um, feeling of, I'm not going to have a job anymore because nobody, there's no, like, I won't have any papers coming to my desk. I won't have envelopes with applications coming to my desk anymore. And then like working through that to understand that your job is changing, that now it's going to be, you know, making those approvals, doing that work online, doing that work through the system, rather than filing actual pieces of paper into a filing cabinet. You guys, Going from physical pieces of paper, physical licenses, physical applications to digital is, is very, very hard. And the older you are, the harder it is. <laughs> We've learned. Preach. <laughs> I think that's one of the things that's a huge faction to consider, right? The public that you serve, the various segments of the public that you serve and how they'll be impacted by change. And in this particular realm, that's regarding licensing, but regulation change is like that. Programmatic offerings is like that. A land access is like that. And so I think you bring up a really good point um, that just being able to address those fears and losses in a meaningful way is, is really important. Kelsey? I'm envisioning said person at a desk that used to have mounds on their desk and that goes down and then that's how they measured progress. And you saw a stack of papers and then they went down, look at all I did today. Everybody can see that I made progress because the stack is down. Now no longer is it in such a visual obvious way for everyone to know that you're doing a great job. 
Um, and so it's the risk of, well, I'm doing it a different way now. How does everyone know that I'm doing a good job? So there's reassurance there of, well, it's all in there. You know, we can still see these things and, you know, maybe we set up whoever can get the most of these done in a day. And there's a report that you can go and see how many of them are done or something, but the, it's bandwidth, right? And it's not only for you to know that I have work to do, but it's also proving to others that the work that you do is beneficial. And if they can't see that the same way, then what am I doing? Um, so thinking through as part of that transition or as part of the change, how can you still reassure those audiences that, that what they will be doing, even though it's not what they're doing today, will be just as, if not more valuable. Mm -hmm. And that relates all the way back to core issues like job satisfaction, personal purpose, and as deeply as general agency culture. And so the ripple effects of that are just huge. Yeah, morale built around sense of achievement and sense of appreciation and, and yeah, your ability to do your work. And so when you're speaking about creating some of these relationships and how that may shift or change the way that work is done or the teams that people have worked within for majorities of their career, those are all the kinds of values to consider and be considerate of certainly and help reassure people that, Hey, this is mutually beneficial work. We're all going to benefit and be more effective and efficient in the work that we do. And we all passionately care about if we work in this way. Uh, Lacey, I saw that you took yourself off mute earlier. I was um, kind of going to go off of what, um, Jessica kind of mentioned that I think going to a more digital and paperless also has some of the licensing and those front support staff thinking that we're caring less about the actual customer. Now they're just a file on a computer or a, uh, an email address. So that disconnect that they feel like they're losing from having somebody hand them a piece of paper or coming in physically to the office is is I would say a, a big concern or a big issue um, or a faction on that map that would definitely be in, in the losses category that they're feeling. Yeah, Lacey, along those lines, how might you um, address that perceived loss or what are some creative ways that you might be able to help comfort people that may be experiencing feelings like that? I don't necessarily know if it's the most efficient, <laughs> but, you know, and, and I don't want to categorize a group of people, but like Jessica said, the older you are, the more challenging it gets to kind of transition to that more digital. So helping those people individually when they can come into the office and having a computer set up where you can walk them through the process so that it doesn't seem so daunting and scary and being able to show them how that system works. Again, is that going to be something that is efficient for everyone? Probably not. Um, but here in our office, I think there are times that we could do that. Um, or maybe again, this is one of those barriers that our three staff could help on somehow. Is there some prompting? Is there some um, something that we could put together that's a step by step? Or is there an alternative way to do this without it? And I'm not proficient in our um, Brant, as we switch over, I'm still learning it too, but is there um, shortcuts or easier ways to, to start with their program or their profile and kind of work them through it? Fantastic. Yeah, thank you for those solutions. You know, it, this is, I mean, this might seem kind of circular, but I just wonder what would happen if the licensing team looked at the customer journey from the beginning of this presentation. <laughs> from Dana's presentation and just realized that the customer journey looked one way before and you were in this role in this way in the previous customer journey, but now that customer journey is changing. So your job has changed in that you're supporting your customer in different, but potentially more meaningful and consistent ways, right? Instead of just talking to them once a year when they call you to help them fill out their application for their lottery draw, now you get to talk to them. You have the opportunity to talk to them like 365 times during the year, right? That's a really incredible point that, that through these tools and through this collaboration, we have the opportunity to be more effective and efficient uh, stewards of our customer base. And I think that's, that's a really great point. I 
folks were at the end of our questions and, and we're going to wrap up and I can't honestly think of a better way um, to have kicked off this series of, of how to enhance your, your R3 teams, but it's not just about enhancing our R3 teams, right? This is about all of the teams that we work within um, and, and just collaborating and, and taking our blinders off and taking a look at, at the resources and um, staff available to us as professionals in this field of, of conservation. So thank you all for helping us kick off this series. And if you're watching this, thank you so much for joining us. Um, please join us next time for the next episode in this series about building your R3 team. I will be releasing uh, quite a few of these coming up in the near future. So stay tuned. Thank you all. Have a great day.